Hi, I'm Jonathan Amy. We're here with Kimberly Behrens, and she's going to be talking about charting concepts. We're, we're so excited to have you here, Kim. Thank you. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited about this and about this YouTube channel. You know, anytime we can put out into the universe, um, you know, powerful information about how to design effective instructional practices and measure those in an effective way such that timely instructional decisions can be made and more importantly you know acceleration of learning gains can be produced with kids that's clearly the passion of my life um, so today i did want to take some time to talk about the importance of using the chart it, you know, even during the state, even during kind of the early stages of learning that some people might consider as, you know, conceptual or teaching concepts. Um, because I do think there's a, well, there are a lot of misunderstandings about what precision teaching actually is. Oh, I forgot to set my timer, guys. Here we go. I'm doing it. Boom. It's set. Um, so, you know, I think there's a, there's some misunderstanding that precision teaching is only for when kids have already been out of this early acquisition phase and they're now just need to practice skills. Um, and also, there, there is a common understanding that the chart is really for free or operant behavior, or behavior that the child, that the learner is in control of, so that the learner can pace and repeat and all of the four free operant freedoms that Og always talked about. And that is all true. But what is, I think, less well understood is that the chart is also a valuable tool to use when you are actually t in, 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 a, in a direct instruction interaction with your child. And again, you know, at Fit Learning, which is my organization, we use direct instruction um, in combination with precision teaching. That's like the hallmark of our approach. So before we go into any type of fluency-based practice, we have done some type of concept instruction. So that may be, for instance, how you sound out words according to the rules of the English language. So how, you know, a short vowel versus a long vowel which is really important for kids to know so that they can apply that rule effectively to sounding out words. So I think there's a, there's not, it's, what's not as well understood is that you can actually chart those interactions you have with your learner. So even though it's not gonna be a classic free operant because you're not starting a timer and a kid's just kind of going on their own accord, you're presenting instructions, you're presenting questions to your learner, so you are imposing a ceiling on their behavior, but it's very important to be able to measure a child's actual learning and mastery of a concept, because that's different than their application of that concept in a practice situation. So like a classic, I'm just gonna use our reading program as an example. So the classic setup at FIT is a child first goes into an instructional, direct instruction interaction, around a rule for how to sound out a word before they go into practice of using that rule in the actual sounding out of words, right? Like, you know, Elizabeth's materials or whatever materials you may be using. So before they go to apply, for instance, sounding out long versus short vowel words, we would engage with them in an instructional interaction about what that rule is using direct instruction. So for instance, we, we use two minute timings for this because again, you kind of want a longer time period because you are gonna be presenting questions to your learner and they have to respond. So you want enough time to be able to do that. So we use two minute timings. So whenever we do a direct instruction interaction with a child at all, we run a two minute timing. And in that timing, as we're pre presenting questions, we're still counting their correct responses. We're counting when we have to prompt them if they've made, you know, if they, if they're pausing or, or thinking for too long, we'll prompt them. And we want to make sure we know, okay, this, this child required a prompt for this question. And then also if they make an incorrect response, we want to count that too. So then we're charting corrects, errors, and prompts at the end of like a two minute instructional interaction. And we put that on a chart, which is really cool because then you get acceleration on conceptual learning right, of, cor of correct conceptual responses and a deceleration on prompts and errors around concepts that, that, that produces this, this fluency in, in a conceptual understanding that they can then fluently apply in decoding exercises, if you understand what I'm saying. So for example, this is how it would go. Like I'd set a timer and I'd say, okay, we're gonna talk about short and long vowels. What are we gonna talk about? And the child says, short and long vowels. Great, so then I start the timing. So what is a short vowel rule? I mean, what does a short vowel tell us? And I pause 
And then the learner says, the vowel, sa the vowel says it's sound. And I say, great. So when the learner says vowel says it's sound, I'm counting that as a correct. And then I say, and what does a long vowel tell us? The vowel says its name, count, right? And how do I know if a vowel is short or long? When a vowel, and the learner might say, when a vowel is short, there's no E at the end of the word. And I'd say, correct. And when a vowel is long, there's an E at the end of the word. And I would say, correct. So I'm counting, so as I'm presenting questions, I'm counting their answers. And sometimes the learner's not gonna know. They're gonna be like, uh, and then I might say, when there's an E at the end, say that. And then they, and then they, and I count that as a prompt. And then they say, when there's an E at the end. And I say, great. So when they don't know an answer or they're pausing or hesitating, I provide them with a model for a correct response. And then I give them the opportunity to answer again. I'll say, okay, so great. So when, it, how do we know it's long? There's an E at the end. Great. So I'm immediately kind of fading my prompts in a two minute timing. And what's amazing, and we've been doing this at FIT for 15 years, we really started combining direct instruction after I'd spent some time at Morningside um, in the early 2000s, I'm aging myself. But I, you know, seeing that happen in classrooms, I was like, this is how we should be teaching concepts. And it, just because we're one-on-one -on -one doesn't mean we can't be using direct instruction. So we've been doing this forever and we create scripts and our coaches have scripts and then they get super fluent at direct at just good instruction. So they don't even need the scripts. They just kind of need to know what are the critical distinctions of the concept we're teaching today. And then they know how to present flexible direct instruction, you know, presentations. And, you know, when you do good direct instruction, you know, the classic thing is present, first of all, understanding how to break a complex concept into its component parts, right? So like long versus short vowel, we know that there's no E at the end of the word, there's an E at the end of the word. When a vowel is long, it says its name. When a vowel is short, it says its sound. Those are kind of the basic critical distinctions of long versus short vowels. So when people are well-trained in how to do DI and they know those four things, then they also know, okay, to, to, to effectively teach concepts, I have to juxtapose, you know, examples and non-examples to, like together, right? So in addition to asking those kind of direct questions, like what's a long vowel? When a vowel says its name. What's a short vowel? When a vowel says its sound. So that would be like a direct question. But to really enrich the learning experience, we also start presenting questions in flexible ways. So I might point to a word and say, so what's this word sounded out? And they might say cat, cat. And I say, great, so that's a long vowel, right? And they'll be like, no which is awesome because you tried to trick them and they got it correct. And you're like, that's right, it's not. Why is it not long? There's no E at the end and the vowel says it's sound. Great, or, right? so you're, so, or I might show a long vowel word and ask the same thing. So is this short? No, it's long, why? Because there's an E. So at FIT, you know, our, our kind of model is we're, we, we push flexibility in responses by pushing flexibility in question types. So we ask direct questions, like here's the definition, you give me the answer, or we might ask what we call misleading questions, like this is a long vowel, right? When it's not, and have them have to be number one, paying attention, number two, know how to fix it. We might just ask them straight up yes, no's, like is this vowel short or long? Is this vowel short, yes or no? Is this vowel long, yes or no? And they have to say a yes, no response. And then what we learned also at Morningside was the cool logical not question, which I love. Which is, so if this, so is this a long vowel? Um, no. So it's not a long vowel, but it is a short vowel. So you can, there's so many things you can do inside that concept instruction interaction that selects attending, it selects understanding, and it produces this mastery of a concept so that what we've actually shown at FIT over the years is that some of our kids who come in with like a sight reading repertoire, like they're super rapid sight readers, but they can't decode a word to save their lives. So we have found that just by producing fluency in the concept through direct instruction, we get agility, um, or you might call it, you know, I don't know what other people call it, but we call it agility, where, where they're applying that concept and we get, um, we get accelerations, like, you know, times two or greater accelerations across decoding of those patterns without them ever practicing that. We just run it as like a test. Like we run a probe. I hate using the term probe, but you know what I mean. Like we run an application check on sounding out words using that concept. And only by teaching the concept of fluency, we get fluency in decoding. 
without even having to have kids practice it because now they understand and they can rapidly apply it. So if they have fluency in phonics and they have fluency in that concept and they've learned how to just, what it means to break a word apart, they can almost fluently do it without even having to practice it ever, which is so awesome because then it just enhances the efficiency of your instruction. Because with just you know, strategic learning, basically, of learning a strategy or a rule, you're getting free stuff, like free fluency of decoding unknown words without having to practice every word list, necessarily. So it really is, I have to say, one of the most valuable things we've discovered and used and evolved over the years is using the chart to measure conceptual learning. And it accelerates like every other thing, you know? And, and even though you are providing instructions during that timing, so you are putting kind of a procedural ceiling, it's okay because number one, if you train your people well, they know how to rapid fire these questions. And they are, I mean, we get kids engaging in 30 responses. Like our aim is about 30 responses per minute on a direct instruction interaction, which is pretty rapid fire, even though like, so we're, we're going fast in these, in these interactions as fast as we can. But it's really an important indication of a child's ability to learn that way. Th their ability, number, and also their attention. I mean, attending is huge in this. So, you know, think about kids in classrooms all day, and I know I'm, so I'm almost finished. My timer just went off. Kids in classroom all day are listening to their teachers, wah, 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 wah. But they don't really have any practice listening and learning in that way. And what we have seen at FID is that when we produce that kind of learning in our, in our context, they become better learners in the classroom context because they've gotten better at listening, right? And learning that way. So it's really been an awesome thing. So I so re encourage everyone to try it. You know, get any direct instruction materials. There's always scripts in there. And practice running those in timed interactions and charting that stuff because it's really remarkable how much agility you even get on learning concepts, you know, not only do you get that application to sounding out, but you also get agility across lessons where kids become faster and faster concept learners. Like once they get, they've learned, if they become fluent at a few concepts, it takes like two sessions and they're fluent at the next one. So they just get better at learning concepts in general, which is really awesome. So that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, well, that two cents is, is worth a, a lot more than that. That was terrific. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> that was a really nice way to really talk about how we can use the chart in a different way that most yeah. people do. Thank you. Yeah. That is outstanding. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Wow, you're welcome. And it's such an honor. To, that was just awesome. I love like seeing, especially seeing Elizabeth's smiling face whenever you're talking. I, I, I wish I had like a, just a, a, me, a picture of you on all my walls. <laughs> Well, we get so I can see your smiling face every day. You just make everyone feel better about the world. <laughs> you really do. Thank you for joining us, Kim. Oh, thanks so much. It was a pleasure. It was awesome.